Welcome to our quarterly seminar. If you joined us live, this probably looks just a little different to you, and that is because, um, unfortunately, us in Zoom had some issues last Saturday. So we are re-recording the whole event, but just know that we are gonna go through the questions and answers just like we did on Saturday, and we're gonna make sure that you all get the same presentation on the recording that you did live. So thank you for joining us. I just wanna make you aware of two upcoming events that we have here at Spooner. The first one is going to be our next quarterly athletic training seminar. That's going to be Saturday, November 20th. And we are actually going to have the Arizona Diamondbacks, some of their sports medicine staff join us for a conversation about treating the baseball athlete. So you should see within the next couple of weeks some more information about that. And we hope that you can either join us live or um, once again, the option will be available virtually. The next event I'd like to tell you about is in March. It is our inaugural sports medicine conference. This is going to be a large format sports medicine conference with main stage speakers, hands-on rotations. We're so excited about this. We hope that you will come to Phoenix if you are not already here and join us for the event. And it is Friday, March 18th and Saturday, March 19th. In case you have never seen me before on one of these, my name is Becca Hibbert. I am the Director of Sports Medicine for Spooner, and I will actually pre be presenting the first talk today. Thank you again for joining us. Apologize about the re-recording, but we look forward to hearing more from you all, seeing your comments, and having you join us for our upcoming events. I have been an athletic trainer for 14 years, and Throughout that time, I have done a lot of wrong things when it came to advocating, especially for myself, but I'm sure for the profession as well. So today what I hope to offer all of you is just some lessons that I've learned along the way. I didn't always do things wrong because I meant to, probably never did that. I did things wrong because I didn't know better, I hadn't learned. And so I hope that today I get to share some of my experiences with you about some of the things that have worked and haven't worked so that you can avoid some of the pitfalls that I have been through in my own career. Remember that these are topics that we can talk about for days on end. There are workshops about advocating for yourself. And so I only have 30 minutes to talk about both advocating for yourself and your profession. So I hope that there's at least one thing in here that maybe you haven't heard before, or maybe it's something you had been doing, but you just let drop off and let today serve as that reminder to keep doing those things. I wanna start off my talk by telling you I have a love-hate relationship with athletic training. I love being an athletic trainer. I completely understand the value of the profession and what we bring to our athletes, our patients, and our clients. But I do hate that 14 years later, I feel like I'm having the same conversations, especially when it comes to salary and advocating for ourselves. So that is why I hope today, in some small way, is a move and a step in the right direction. Let me start today with providing you with some of the worst career advice I've ever received. I was working at a college. I was the head slash only, I know some of you know how that is, athletic trainer, and all my outdoor sports were off campus. All my indoor sports were on campus. I was running around. It was a crazy time. At the end of one of the years, the company I was contracted with decided that the contract no longer served them. No bad blood, no issues, it just didn't make sense. And so at that time I was under a non-compete, but they knew that the college and myself had had such a great relationship that they let the college know we're not gonna enforce that non-compete, you should hire her if you guys want to. So the college came to me and offered me the same exact job for $2,000 less. To say I was annoyed, <laughs> is an understatement. But mostly my frustration, not just from being offered $36,000 when I was already only making 38, my frustration came from spending that whole previous year talking not to just the company I had been contracted with, but to the college and the administrators about the value of what I did, about needing help, how I could not be the only person anymore, and advocating for myself. So one of the administrators at the college knew that I was frustrated by this and he called me and he said, Becca, don't, it's just a couple thousand dollars less than you're already making. Don't give up a job you like for that. We have to remember that sometimes with the worst advice also comes the best lessons. What I learned that day 
is that no one will or should be expected to care about my career as much as I do. No one will and no one should be expected to make me a priority above themselves, above the department. He didn't mean it in a bad way, but he was giving me terrible advice. <laughs> I ended up leaving that job. And I'll be honest with you, it is by far the best career decision I've ever made. It completely changed the trajectory of the path that I was on. And honestly, I would not have the job I have now if I had not made that decision. But as we go along today in my talk, I just want you to hold on to this one piece of advice I'm gonna give you next, if nothing else. At the end of the day, it is your decision. It is your career. And it is your mental and physical well-being on the line. So you have to make the decisions that are best for you. So first I wanna start with the number one rule of negotiation. Are you ready? It's gonna blow your mind. The number one rule is to ask. You might be saying, I am spending an hour of my life listening to this and this is the advice. But let me tell you, it's not just in athletic training, it's not just in sports medicine, it's not just in healthcare. In every profession, so many of us make the same mistake. I know I made it, I'm sure some of you have made it too. We assume that people will see the hard work that we put in. We assume that they will see the long hours, the exhaustion, the spreading ourselves thin, and that they will reward that behavior or reward that financially. And I wanna be honest with you, that's not gonna happen. There may be times it does, but you should not live your life hoping that that's going to happen. If you don't ask, people assume you are fine. And I will be honest with you, rightfully so, they make that assumption. You have to ask. So, when you're advocating for yourself in a new job, what are some things that you should be doing? First, never accept an initial offer. So after I left the college, I had no idea what I was going to do. Eventually, I was offered a job through a hospital system. And they, the HR department called me, they offered me more money than I was making, more money probably than I thought I would potentially ever make. <laughs> and I was thrilled. I had, however, learned somewhere down the line that you never make a quick decision when it comes to accepting a new position. And so I gave them the classic, give me 24 hours, I need to talk to my husband and I'll get back to you. I did talk to my husband, but more importantly, I talked to my sister, who is an executive in a completely different kind of profession than myself. And she said to me, that's awesome. Now you're gonna go ask for more money. Maybe you didn't hear me. They offered me a really good salary. I don't care. You go back and you ask for more money. You negotiate for more pay. It will be the only chance you have to do it. And you almost always leave money on the table when you don't ask. So I went back to the HR department, as I was told. And I said, you know, thank you for the offer. I'm really excited. This is a range I feel more comfortable with. Now in a hospital system, they have their ranges down to a T. They know your job, they know your experience, and they find that number. But they did offer me a bonus, a sign-on bonus, excuse me, and they gave me $5,000. Now I pretended like I knew that was gonna happen, and I didn't, but once again, that advice was so key for my sister. You go back and you negotiate. You have to remember that you have nothing to lose when you're asking for a higher salary. You have nothing to lose when you negotiate. They're not going to take back the offer. It, negotiation doesn't end until somebody says best and final offer. And yes, they may say that on the first phone call, and of course that may change some things, but usually they don't because you have to remember they want you. They chose you for the position. Most HR departments, honestly, come in a little low because they assume you will negotiate. And if you don't, they just know that you don't have experience and I don't know, maybe they get, a, <laughs> they high five each other and are excited that they talked somebody into a little bit lower salary. But at the end of the day, they assume you're gonna come back and negotiate. 
On a little bit side note, you know, you should always expect to be treated like an adult. And what I mean by that is I have dealt with several HR departments that had no idea what an athletic trainer was. But any time I went back to negotiate or ask questions, they always respected me, they always valued me. So if you're dealing with an HR department or a direct report, whoever it is, you should expect to be treated as an adult. And that is a big red flag if you're not. Probably don't wanna be with that company. Negotiating doesn't mean you will get what you ask for, but you definitely won't get anything if you don't ask. Another thing I think we talk a lot about is knowing your value and knowing your worth. And these are very important items. What you have to remember is do not tell them at a new job what you currently make. Most states actually have a law that states they are not allowed to ask you what you currently make. So make sure you are aware of your state laws before you go into a position. If you're asked that question, you can simply respond and a great response is, I would be more interested in hearing what you all have budgeted for this position. If they keep pushing for a salary response, this is where you wanna have done your research before you walk into these conversations. Provide them with a range, not a single number, and do not undervalue yourself. Provide them with a range that makes sense, that goes with the job that you are wanting to take. What value does this job place on you? Not what did you make at your old job? Repeat that to yourself anytime you're afraid to ask for a little bit more or to give them a range. You have to remember also that there are other things that you can ask for. It's not just always salary. You know, as you learned from my story, I had no idea that companies gave sign on bonuses at the time, but that is something that you can ask for. You can ask for more flex time, more money for continuing education, maternity and paternity leave if they don't already have that. There are various things that you can ask for beyond just a salary. Now you can ask for just a salary, you can ask for just some of these other items, or you can ask for them all together. It's called negotiation because you wanna work through some of those items. Lastly, be self-aware. You have to be logical in your request. Listen, you know, athletic training is not the best paying profession and it needs to get better and that's what we're talking about today. But you also have to be aware of what are the state averages for your position. So you can always go in and ask for $30,000 more than the state average, but be aware that you probably are gonna to be told no, so be logical have the research to back it up and you know just a quick note to athletic trainers know what your experience pays you know i know for a few jobs you know i said i had my master's before it was required didn't move the needle i had lots of years of experience oh well this is just what the job pays that's not okay so don't allow a job to just tell you no matter years of experience, education level, that's just what you get paid. Make sure that you know what your experience pays and that they pay you that way. So let's say you're already in a job and you wanna ask for a raise. There are three questions that you should be asking yourself before you go in to talk to your direct report. Have you been at a, your job for a year? Unless there's been a completely different job title added to you, massive changes to your job, it's going to be very difficult to go in at three, six, nine months, whatever it is, and ask for a raise. This is why initial negotiation is so important. Second question, have you taken on new responsibilities since you've been hired? If you have, be prepared with a list of what those are. As I always tell people, have your job description. I don't think it's something that people do enough. I will ask for my job descri description before I decide to take a job. One, because you wanna be able to look through it and make sure there's no hidden gems, shall we say, in there that you're not prepared for. But two, you should have it because then as you get a year into your job, a couple years into your job, whatever it is, you and your manager can go down the, that job description and talk about what's changed, where's the value in those changes. Third, have you been exceeding expectations rather than just meeting them? Here's where self-awareness comes back in. There is nothing wrong with doing a job, absolutely nothing. But there is a difference between doing the job that you were hired to do and exceeding the expectations of that job. So if you are going in for a large raise, asking for a large raise, you do have to understand that your boss may say, well, you know, this is what you agreed to, and 
you've been doing the job. Once again, this is why initial negotiation is so important and why self-awareness is so important. Obviously, as you can tell, the answer to all three of those questions should probably be yes. Well, that puts you on the easiest track to ask for an increase in salary. And if they're not all yes, then you need to probably reevaluate your, reevaluate your strategy. That doesn't mean it's over. It simply means you have to reevaluate how you're doing it because you need to explain why you deserve a raise beyond just wanting one. Lastly, when it comes to advocating for yourself, let's talk about learning boundaries and learning when to say no. Some of you may be a little surprised that boundaries is one of those items that are very that is very important when it comes to advocating for yourselves. But here's why. And I'm not putting this on any of you. This is a term I came up for myself. You know, I burned out of regular of the collegiate setting for athletic training. I had a savior complex. I was the only athletic trainer. I was the only person that did the job. I was the only one there. I had to be there. I had to be there. And what I ended up doing was sacrificing myself in order to do that. I was not setting boundaries. I have a really good friend. Her name is Vanessa Shannon. She's fabulous, who is a sports psychologist. And I wish I had known her before my burnout, but I met her after. And what she often talks about is control the controllables. In a career like athletic training where so much is out of our control, you have got to control what you can. You have to set the boundaries. If a change happens last minute and you didn't know, do you still go? If an athlete tells you about change of plans but you never hear it from a coach or administrator, do you still go? When there are extra duties or PRN or your company is having a hard time hiring people, are you the person they always go to because you always say yes even though there's other people to ask? And are you still saying yes? Are you working the time they're paying you for? This is not a comment on 40 hours a week, five days a week. That's not what this is a comment on. What this is saying is perhaps you did negotiate a good initial salary, but you have such a hard time putting up boundaries, knowing when to say no, that you're just always feeling stretched thin, you're always exhausted, and you're starting to feel like you're not making the money that you thought you were. What is in your control that you are allowing others to control, which is making you feel that way? Obviously, as you control your schedule or figure out ways you can do that, it has to be in a way that works for you and your employer. Um, but I don't think that underworking is a problem in athletic training. It is the overworking, the pushing ourselves to exhaustion, the sacrificing ourselves that I see as the bigger issue. So I don't think we're ever gonna have an issue where people are trying to work two days a week to be an athletic trainer. I just think that we have to learn boundaries. Let's switch gears and talk about advocating for the profession. So obviously I'm an athletic trainer. That is the expertise I have, the experience I have. So that is what I'm going to speak to. But I know that we have other sports medicine professionals joining us. And so I hope that there's at least a few things in here, and I think there will be, that also apply to you and your profession. I hope that we've that maybe I present something that you haven't seen before, or haven't heard before, and you, or at least see it in a new way and take that into your advocating for your profession. Advocating for your profession is often taking those things we just talked about when it comes to advocating for yourself and making it now about the collective whole. So, if you work for a company, that has three athletic trainers, 10 athletic trainers, 75 athletic trainers, and there are common issues and concerns. Are you all getting together outside of work, coming up with strategies, having discussions about what you can bring to your bosses? Here's what you have to remember. Right or wrong, disorganization amongst a group of employees often can seem like complaining. You're in a room of 20, 25 people. It's, you know, your, it's your quarterly athletic training meeting. And you always have those few that stand up and say stuff. And then you have a room of people that all look a little nervous, a few people maybe chime in. To a boss, 
what you're seeing is, are these just these issues of these few people, which is not to say it's not a concern, but is it just the issue of a few people, or is it the concern of the group? So if you come together, you come up with strategies, come up with a plan, and you present that as a group, then it is a lot harder to fight a collective voice than a singular one. It is a lot harder as a boss, as an employer, to say, oh, those people just complain, versus saying, you know what? This is a real issue that we need to deal with. You have to be prepared for pushback. Is that frustrating? Yes. But rarely anything in life do we get exactly what we want right when we ask for it. So you have to be persistent. Persistence creates change. It either creates change in you or it creates change in them. And by that, what I mean is, if you do all the right things, you prove your value, you strategize, and they're still turning a blind eye to the issue, it's gonna create a change in you to go find a job that you feel like meets those demands or you're gonna create your own job that meets those demands. Or if you do all those same things and your employer hears you and values that and makes those changes, then it creates a change in them. Persistence creates change. You just don't know who that change is going to be in first. Interprofessional networking. We have to have other professions talking about our profession. I used to work with one of the best concussion specialists in the country, and no matter what conversation he was having, if he was in front of parents, athletes, coaches, sports medicine professionals, oftentimes somewhere in his talk he would say, I have so much respect for what athletic trainers do. The quick decisions they have to make on the sidelines when it comes to concussions, the backlash they can get from coaches, the athlete, the parents, that's a hard job and I have so much respect for it. Do you know what that does for somebody who's not an athletic trainer to stand up in front of a room and say, I'm an expert in this and I still value what these experts do because it's different than what I do. It's about collaboration, not competition. If I've learned anything working in a hospital system before this with physicians and now working in a physical therapy company with PTs, ATs, strength and conditioning coaches, Every sports medicine profession has frustrations and barriers. What if we chose to work together to solve those issues and help the other professions to elevate all the professions? So much of the advancements we make as a profession will have a lot to do with who we know and who wants to advocate alongside of us. So who do we know? Advocate for the profession, not the company. Put aside the barrier of who you work with. The secondary setting is one of the largest settings for athletic trainers. And on a lot of places, the majority of those contracts are not through the high school who sees the athletic trainer all the time and who sees that work all the time. They're through hospital com or hospitals or PT companies. There is nothing innately wrong with that. The issue becomes when we start to be competitive as the athletic trainers with the other company, instead of saying, how do we leverage this competitiveness amongst our companies to elevate the pay of the athletic trainers? It's about pay transparency. If you're a director of sports medicine or you manage the athletic training contracts, are you willing and able to get together with some of your competitors in the area and simply talk about how do we work together to elevate pay? We'll still be competing over athletic trainers, we'll still have our opinions, but how do we get together and make the pay better for the whole area we're in? This is not disloyalty to your company. This is not trading the secrets. This is simply finding a way to elevate the profession from the point of view that you have, from the um, power that you have in the position that you have in those companies. Lastly, when it comes to advocating for the profession, a note for my more seasoned athletic trainers like myself, with great or even some responsibility comes power. And when I say that, I do not mean power of title. I mean if you've been in the profession for many years, 
five years, 10 years, 30 years, you have more power than somebody new in the profession. Too often, we look at the younger generation and we say, why are you taking that job? Why are you taking that low salary? That pressure should not fall to them. That pressure is on us. Yes, if you have a title like myself, a director of sports medicine, or you manage a lot of athletic trainers, or you're the highest ranking athletic trainer in your company, I will tell you, and I put this on myself, and I know so many of you do too, the pressure should be high. The pressure should be high for you to advocate for those athletic trainers because you are in a power or in a position of power to do it. I know so many of you already are. I know so many of you are frustrated. I have been there. It took me four years, four years, to get a raise for the athletic trainers that worked in the clinic that I was in. But I also knew if I didn't do it, who would? So I'm asking you, if you don't do it, who will? Choose words and advice wisely with the younger generation. I don't know about you, but when I started in this career, I made $34,000. For the first eight years of my career, I never made more than $38,000. I don't want that for the next generation. That is a quick and easy way for this profession to start decreasing in growth, to just have so many issues. I believe that paying your dues as an athletic trainer is being an athletic trainer. When you're, especially when you're young, so often we're by ourselves. The decisions we have to make, the emergency situations that come up, the back and forth with administrators and coaches and parents, that is paying your dues. I do not believe that low salaries are the way to pay dues. So we have to be honest about pay. We have to guide the younger generation. We have to have pay transparency and once again, we have to take whatever power we have and use it for that next generation to have it just a little bit better, hopefully a lot better pay-wise than we did. I'm going to end the same way I started. I love athletic training. And what I hate about it, I hope to continue to advocate for the changes to take it in a new direction. And I hope that you will join me. Thank you. If you have any questions, um, comments, concerns, feedback, by all means, my email is here. I would be happy to talk with any of you and learn more about you and find ways that maybe I can help you. So question and answer. Two of the questions that I received, one question was about the difficulty of being in a role at a let's say college setting you want to show respect to your alumni and they'll send you emails saying they're looking for people but you also are teaching your current students not to take jobs for certain amounts of money and so where's the line there you know respecting the alumni sending those emails out but then also not promoting jobs that basically go against what you're telling students so my answer to that question is simply can you get together with your colleagues at the college in the athletic training department and come up with a number. You know, this is the minimum salary that we will promote. And I think that you can nicely put out an email to your alumni and say, you know, we are so appreciative of everything you all do. We love promoting you and your profession and your companies. But we are going to require, as a way to move this profession forward, that any job you send us has to meet this minimum salary. That would be my answer to that question. The other question I received was, do I feel that the shortage of athletic trainers throughout the country right now has to do with low starting salaries? Yes, I do believe that, 100%. And in part, I think it's because um, my husband's also an athletic trainer. We dealt with this ourselves too often. When COVID started, the first people laid off were athletic trainers. And I think that what so many athletic trainers realized in that time was I can keep doing this job, I can keep pushing into this profession and feel undervalued, or I can say no, put a boundary up and either go find an athletic training position where I am valued 
or I can just do something completely different. And I think that's what we're seeing is that a lot of athletic trainers were just saying, I'm not gonna keep sacrificing myself, my time for such low pay and to be undervalued. And I do think that's a reason we're seeing the shortage, though I do believe and hope, you know, sometimes supply and demand. Right now, the demand is high and the supply is low. And it may be a way to increase salaries. So it could get us there a little quicker than maybe we have over my past 14 years. Hi, my name is Christy Barth and I am a functional performance dietitian. And I'm gonna be talking to you um, for the second part of the presentation about advocating for your athletes' nutritional requirements. So a few objectives that hopefully you will learn by the end of this presentation. Um, the first one is that you will learn about the role of a sports dietitian. You'll also discover when and how it is best to advocate for an athlete's and for an athlete's nutrition in order to optimize their recovery and performance. And you'll also learn about which specific athletes can benefit from working with a sports dietitian. So this quote right here um, is actually by one of my mentors early on when I became a sports dietitian back in 2004, and her name is Nancy Clark. She's based out of, I believe, Massachusetts still. And if you haven't read her book or heard of her, I would highly recommend her nutrition guidebook, her sports nutrition guidebook. She's got many editions. I think the latest one is the fourth edition. It, there might be a newer edition. I'm not too sure. But if you are an athletic trainer and you're looking to learn more about sports nutrition and how to communicate nutrition to your athletes, I think this would be a really great book for you to have. I know when I um, actually, I think I got the one of the first editions when I was still a student in undergrad studying dietetics and um, just fell in love with her way of educating people about sports nutrition. It's a very, very easy read, very informative, very helpful. Really, um, she debunks a lot of myths too, which is always wonderful to, to read about. But her quote um, she says that the performance of an athlete can be impaired or improved significantly based on the adequacy of their diet. And so bottom line is that nutrition is such an important role in an athlete's performance and recovery. You can have a phenomenal athlete, but if they're not feeling optimally, they're not going to perform at their peak potential. And then on the flip side, you can have a good athlete, not the best athlete, but a good athlete. And if they're, if they're fueling optimally, they're going to perform at their peak potential. And so food or rather good food is good medicine. Cause we also know that depending upon one's diet, food can be not so great medicine. So really educating the athlete about optimal nutrient rich food to help them perform at their best. And so a case study that I wanted to share is about two injured athletes. So both of them are phenomenal athletes, basketball players, the one athlete, and they're both injured. The one athlete was living on fast food from breakfast to dinner. And he felt great. He had tons of energy. He was a just phenomenal athlete. Didn't think anything about it. Just continued eating his fast food for the majority of his meals and snacks. The other athlete was really conscientious about his nutrition intake. Ate very well, all of his meals, snacks, planned ahead was really on top of his game with his nutrition. Well, they both got injured and the athlete that was eating a lot of fast food did not recover as quickly as the other athlete that was really made nutrition top priority or continue to make it top priority. And he recovered at a pretty speedy rate. Um, the other athlete who was living on fast food I believe he learned more about the importance of nutrition and in time, he slowly changed his diet um, because living on fast food isn't the best thing for us. Fast food here and there are perfectly fine, but for all your meals, it's not gonna fuel your, your body as well as nutrient-rich foods. 
let alone help your body recover. So when it comes to that team effort, you can see that a sports dietitian is a part of that team effort, as well as a team physician, athletic trainer, physical therapist, sports psychologist, coach, trainer, parent, athlete. It really takes that whole team to help that athlete be the best athlete that he or she can be. And I was very fortunate because when I became a dietitian back in 2004, there weren't that many di uh, sports dietitian positions available. And so when I started my own business back then, it was primarily geared towards working with athletes and also those that were recovering from eating disorders. And I was very fortunate that one of the first teams that I worked with was a phenomenal soccer club in the Phoenix metro area. And when I went away to the coaches retreat, it was actually in town um, at a beautiful resort um, in Scottsdale. And it was such a great learning experience for me because I got to see what a great group of professionals this team was. And these, this, this sport, it was primarily um, working with athletes that were like, gosh, grade school through high school. And they had just a, a coach for every age group. They had a sports psychologist. Um, I mean, a lawyer, I mean, everything. And it was just a great learning experience for me to see how a team can work together. And it's not just the coach and the athlete, but it's everybody. It's that collective unit. And so that was a really great experience for me. And we're seeing more and more nowadays, now that we're in 2021, that a lot of these sports teams, I would say primarily collegiate level and professional level, you're seeing a huge sports medicine and training facility or training team um, composed of all of these different professionals and then some more because it does take that team effort. Absolutely. So what is a functional sports dietitian? So a functional sports dietitian is a dietitian that specializes in sports nutrition and who also offers a personalized and holistic approach to help the athlete maximize their health development and sports performance. And so not only do we talk about or educate the athlete about food, which encompasses, of course, nutrition education and hydration, but also supplementation. I mean, supplementation includes just a vast variety of different supplements from vitamins, minerals, sports performance enhancers to engineered sports foods. And it's really important that when we're, we're working with athletes, that we try to recommend supplements, especially if the athlete is of the collegiate level or professional level, that the supplements need to be NSF certified for sport or informed sport, because these are two organizations that test products for banned substances. Now, can we always promise that a supplement is going to be free of banned substances? I like to say yes. Um, however, there was a recent incident that I'm aware of where unfortunately an athlete took a supplement that was supposed to be free of banned substances, but in reality, whatever supplement this athlete was taking actually had a banned substance in it. So we have to be so careful what we recommend athletes, recommend to athletes when it comes to supplements. Um, but by all means, refer out to a sports dietitian and as well as the um, sports medicine physician as well. Um, we also take into consideration lifestyle. So sleep is such an important part to an athlete's performance and recovery plan as well as stress management. And of course, um, as sports dietitians, we take into consideration their activity level as well. Um, as well, um, traditional and functional labs, traditional labs or conventional labs, like your typical um, blood sugar, blood glucose, um, cholesterol, liver functioning, enzyme tests and things of that sort. But functional labs is what is somewhat newer 
that is being offered for athletes and for all people, but specifically athletes. So for these functional labs, when I order or when I look at a functional lab test, I'm typically recommending either um, a test that um, is a gut health test so we can get a better idea of what is going on in the gut because we know that our health begins in the gut. Um, there's also um, tests such as food allergy tests or food sensitivity tests. And then what's also very um, uh, popular among athletes is getting their micronutrient test done, which basically um, lets us know what their vitamin and mineral status is. And we get a printout that tells us if the athlete is at normal levels or borderline deficiency and deficiency. And so um, just a really good baseline to get. And then of course, educating them on food first and then supplements second. Um, so, cause I mean, if there are so many athletes that I know that just take so many supplements and we don't need to take so many supplements, that's why it's good to get a good baseline, um, from this particular test and then supplementing accordingly. And then lastly, um, giving the athlete resources and then also referrals. So one example of an important referral would be if I'm working with an athlete that I know has an eating disorder. I want to make sure that I refer this athlete to a therapist that specializes in eating disorders. And so what is the sports dietitian's role in the sports setting? So I know when I early on in my career, when I became a dietitian, um, I worked with a, a team and it, it seemed to me that this team I think what they thought of a dietitian is that a dietitian helps people lose weight. Um, and so they, you know, if they had an athlete, it was usually, I was seeing the athlete because the athlete wanted to lose weight. Um, however, it's just, you know, just educating everybody about what a sports dietitian is capable of doing. And so, as you can see from this list, sports dietitians can do a lot. So they are a valuable resource for coaches, trainers, parents, teachers, and sports medicine physicians when it comes to nutrition. They provide individual or small group nutrition consultations. I know when I worked in, for example, when I worked in Major League Baseball, um, it was always really great because the team that I was working with, um, I would go to the, the training complex and I would either meet with athletes individually or as a team, giving a team nutrition presentation, or the strength coach would oftentimes break up the players in different groups. So I'd be working with the, let's say the, the pitchers and the catchers, the infielders, the outfielders. And so it was very well organized, but as a sports dietitian, he or she can work with anybody individually, small group, settings or large team settings as well, or even maybe just working with the, with the athletic trainers or the, the physicians. Um, really, it can be um, working with anybody within that, that team. Um, sports dietitians also develop and deliver nutrition presentations for the team, like I said, so a large um, group setting. And this can be anywhere from like a sports nutrition 101 or one um, talk emphasizing um, recovery, nutrition, performance, nutrition, supplements, hydration. So it can be really much anything in terms of sports nutrition. Um, they also participate in events and develop and monitors a team's hydration and fueling protocols. They plan team meals for training table, including a sports team's budget. Now, not every sports team has a training table. We oftentimes will see this in most collegiate settings and then also most professional settings. But the training table is where the athletes go to fuel or to eat. And so typically training tables are um, primarily set for breakfast and lunch. And then sometimes like a grab and go dinner. And this is both um, for practices and also games. And then lastly, sports dietitians provide nutritional supplement education for before, during, and after training and competition. There are so many supplements out there. Some of them are fantastic and worthy of taking, but a lot of it is just garbage. And so it's really educating the athlete about supplements in general and what is good for each athlete because everybody's different. So what's going to be good for one person? might not be good for somebody else. 
And so who can benefit from working with a sports dietitian? Well, as a sports dietitian, I would, this is an easy answer for me. I would say everybody can benefit from working with a sports dietitian. It's just like when, when athletes meet with their sports medicine physician for their annual physical, I think they should be meeting with a sports dietitian every year. Um, they can highly benefit, they can just benefit from that in a, in a huge way. So when to refer to a sports dietitian. So I would say these are your highest priority referrals. Um, first and foremost is trust your gut. If your gut's telling you, you know, I think my athlete can benefit from a sports dietitian, by all means, refer out. Second group, um, which is highly beneficial for referring out to a dietitian, would be those with eating disorders and also relative energy deficiency in sport, which is known as red S. So the, the sooner that you can get your athlete treatment or help regarding these two areas, the better the outcome for the athlete will be. So the red S, basically the female athlete triad, it's kind of morphed into red S. So the female athlete triad was helpful, it was educational, but red S actually encompasses both males and female athletes. So basically the athlete is not consuming enough nutrition to maintain his or her performance and healthy weight range. So if an athlete is under fueling, that's going to slow down their metabolism and basically slow down every part of their bodies and brains because the body likes to be in balance. And so because the body fears starving, the metabolism is going to slow down to compensate for under fueling. Well, by under fueling, that's going to eventually affect one's hormones. So for females, estrogens, males, testosterone. And when that happens, we can start to see, especially in, in female athletes, because they're not going to get their monthly menstrual cycle to support their bone mass. Then we start to see osteopenia and then soon full-blown osteoporosis, which is weakening of the bones. And this can affect both males and females um, because we need our, our healthy bones are determined by having healthy hormones. And so again, the, the sooner that you can refer out, if you suspect any type of disordered eating, it's always best to refer out to a sports dietitian. Now, not all red S athletes have disordered eating they might just be super busy, super active, and they might, which for me, it's hard to believe, but they might just forget to eat or their appetite might not be the best. And so it's good to educate them on the importance of a sports nutrition optimal diet for them. Injured athletes, by all means, are highest priority because they have elevated nutrition and micronutrient needs. Gut health challenges, which were actually, I mean, I'm seeing a lot more of these gut health challenges. And I think a lot of it is because of our food supply. I think there are about 10 to 15 substances that our government puts in our food supply that are banned in other countries. And over time, the body just can't process these ingredients. And so it really affects our gut health, which can lead to food allergies, food sensitivities, leaky gut. IBD, which is irritable bowel disease, this can be colitis and Crohn's. Oftentimes there is a genetic predisposition to IBD, um, but stress can also make it, um, can also exacerbate it. IBS, which is um, irritable bowel syndrome, it's kind of a big umbrella term for something is going on with the gut and we're not quite sure what that is. Um, stress and anxiety can also cause IBS symptoms. Um, I didn't put this on here, but um, celiac disease were, is more and more common these days because I think now people are getting tested for celiac. And so we're seeing that um, celiac disease is another big um, gut health challenge. So celiac disease is basically somebody that has, um, they're not able to uh, digest um, gluten and we get gluten. There's an acronym called BROW. So we find gluten in barley, rye, cross-contaminated oats and wheat. And so these athletes that have celiac, they can never have gluten again. If they do, they do run the risk of having gut health challenges from not being able to absorb nutrients, long-term side effects if they continue to eat gluten can lead to cancer.
So celiac is serious, but the beauty of nutrition is that there are so many gluten-free foods out there now, and they taste good too. Um, and then lastly, SIBO and candida. So SIBO and candida are both, um, they have to do with, well, SIBO is basically it's, um, it means small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And then candida is a yeast overgrowth. So there's an overgrowth of either bad bacteria or yeast that is affecting our gut health and left untreated. This can lead to leaky gut and food sensitivities, et cetera. So gut health is very important. Um, mental wellness is also very important. I know, especially during uh, COVID, I saw a lot more athletes that were um, being challenged with anxiety and depression because they were not able to um, go to their sport. And, um, and by doing so, these athletes, um, I noticed a lot of them were under eating. Um, some were overeating. And so, you know, under eating, overeating, you know, can be normal at times. Um, but when it's continuously being abused, I guess, where the athlete continuously under eats or continuously overeats, um, it can lead to possibly an eating disorder or can be a red flag for an eating disorder. Um, autoimmune conditions like type one diabetes, by all means, refer out to a, a dietitian. Oftentimes, if a dietitian takes insurance, this will be covered by insurance. Concussions and head injury recovery. There's so much exciting research coming in, out about brain health and brain nutrition. And so this is where another um, critical high priority athlete, if they're suffering or rec recovering from these injuries, it, they by all means should be meeting with a, should be meeting with a dietitian, um, just to make sure that they're getting an adequate nutrients to help their brain heal. And then vegans and vegetarians. So vegans are like no animal proteins whatsoever. Vegetarians still consume dairy and eggs. The vegans we really want to be careful of because vegans, and I, there was a. I, it kind of comes in waves where I see vegans and, you know, living on bagels and vegan cream cheese is not the best diet for athletes or for any vegan for that matter. Um, but vegans can eat a really good balanced vegan sports nutrition diet um, with education. Um, but vegans are at risk for a myriad of different deficiencies from B12, vitamin D, calcium, zinc, iron, omega-3s. So it's really important that they do meet with a, with a sports dietitian to make sure that how they're fueling is optimal for them. And then athletes that want to um, gain weight and lose weight. I mean, gaining weight, losing weight can be done in a healthful manner, and they can also be done in a very unhealthy disorder manner. Um, so reaching out to a sports dietitian um, to help them with that. And even to see if, if weight loss is necessary, um, that might be a, a, a red flag for something else that that's going on, but athletes that want to gain weight, I mean, this can be done correctly and incorrectly. Um, you know, for example, my, my brother played football in college and, um, gosh, I, don't, I forget what year this was, but this must've been back in the early two thousands or late 1990s. And, one of his friends who also played collegiate football um, was trying to gain weight and his way of gain, gaining weight was just overeating on fast food, ice cream, pizza. And it's not the best way to gain weight because you want to gain weight healthfully, you know, yes, a little bit of extra body fat, but also some more muscle mass too. So by all means, refer out to a sports dietitian because unfortunately athletes that gain weight this way long-term um, I know I worked when I worked in, um, in football, um, there was one physician that I was working for, um, and he would see a lot of retired football players. And it was so sad because a lot of these men were in their fifties and sixties and their diets back in those days were just horrid. They, they didn't have sports dietitians educate them. So I was seeing a lot of these players for high cholesterol, heart disease, high blood pressure. So um, again, there is a, a, a right way to gain weight and a wrong way to gain weight. And then these other um, groups of athletes still, I mean, highly recommend referring them to a sports dietitian, but not your highest priority. Anybody that wants to optimize their performance and recovery, those that want additional supplement education, those that might just wanna learn more about sports nutrition, 
those that want to increase energy, those that want their annual nutrition checkup, and lastly, those that might be interested in functional or traditional or conventional lab testing to, by all means, refer out to a sports dietitian. How to seek out a sports dietitian. Um, the first thing is I would always recommend creating that referral list um, consisting of both um, sports dietitians that are private cash pay and those that um, also accept insurance. And some dietitians um, do both. They, they, they take private cash pay and also insurance. I would say collaborating with a sports dietitian, either if you work for a facility or training program, hospital or medical facility, maybe collaborating on a consulting basis, or if you can hire this person as an employee, I think a sports dietitian can easily fit into any, any area, whether it be a training facility, a chiropractor's office, a, a sports medicine physician's office, um, a PT clinic, um, a, a performance center. I mean, really, I mean, a sports dietitian can be utilized in any setting, honestly. I would say offering educational clinics or workshops can be done virtually or in person where maybe the sports dietitian is presenting with the athletic trainer like we're doing today. Um, I mean, I think both, of, both um, athletic trainers and sports dietitians can work so well together. And then also looking into specific groups to find sports dietitians. So one is SCAN and the other one is CPSDA. Um, they're comprised of a variety of sports dietitians. You can log on to their website and usually um, find a listing of sports dietitians in your area. And also now that we've gone, a lot of us have gone virtual so we can work um, primarily anywhere in the USA. Uh, or anywhere in the world for that matter on a virtual platform. And then lastly is networking at conferences. I run um, the CPSDA, which is the Collegiate and Professional Sports Dietitians Association is coming here um, in Phoenix. I think it's Scottsdale, Arizona um, in, uh, next, next spring actually. So this is a great place to learn more about sports nutrition and to network with like-minded people. And lastly, the traits to look for when you are seeking out the advice from a sports nutrition professional. So definitely credentials are important. I would say RD, which is a registered dietitian, um, those that are CSSD, which um, are certified specialists in sports dietetics is another really great credential to look for. And then even PhDs, I mean, PhDs might not be an RD, there are RDs that do have a PhD as well or a master's degree, but a PhD in sports nutrition, um, exercise physiology, kinesiology, um, any of those would be great. Um, also one that has experience both professionally and athletically, those that offer that personalized and functional approach. So what's gonna work for one athlete might not necessarily work for all athletes. That's why there's not a one diet fits all model. It's all very personalized and um, holistic in, in the approach. And then also when we think about how we educate athletes, it kind of consists of a mixture of science and art. Um, one example of this is that Gosh, in, in my career as a sports dietitian, I guess two like polar opposites um, as far as clients. One of my first um, sports nutrition clients early on was a, a gentleman who was um, in his 40s and he was going down the unhealthy path of being overweight, carrying around excess body fat high cholesterol, borderline diabetes, high triglycerides, and his father passed away in his early 40s of, of, of a heart attack. And he didn't want to go down that path. He was married, had, had a family. And so he was like, okay, I'm going to seek out a sports dietitian. I'm going to have her help me train for an Ironman. And um, he was amazing. I mean, to see somebody go from one extreme to the other was an amazing change. Um, he, all of his lab values improved. He was super in tune to his nutrition. 
he would, when he and I would meet, he would bring all of his like spreadsheets of like all of his food and nutrient and, you know, protein, carbs, fat and everything. I mean, it was, he probably knew more than, than I did at the time actually, but he was a great person to work with because he was so hungry to want to really make that change. And now to see him do Ironman, you know, events, it was just phenomenal. And then on the other spectrum, there was a phenomenal um, veteran professional football player that I was fortunate to work with and really great guy. And um, he reached out to me, asked me, you know, what should he have for, for lunch? And so I, you know, I gave him just, you know, a, a little quick, like um, tidbit of, of what I recommended. So the, the whole plate visual about, you know, half your plate or a third of your plate, vegetables, proteins, um, carbs. And his response was, was what's a carb? Um, so, you know, it had to be kind of creative and like how you describe what a carbohydrate is. And so, um, you know, being a sports dietitian, it does take that nutrition science delivery and then also that artistic delivery too and in, in how we get the message across and really meeting the athlete kind of where they're at too. Cause I mean, as a, you know, as a dietitian, I mean, I have numerous stories. I can write a, probably like a trilogy of, of different athletes that I've worked with and, you know, how I speak to one athlete is going to be very different. How I speak to another athlete, everybody has different needs, desires, goals. And so it's really just, um, you know, personalizing everybody's nutrition um, plan appropriately. And then lastly, um, which I think is a very important one is referring out to somebody that, that, that truly cares about the athlete. You know, one, there's so many wonderful things about working with athletes as a sports dietitian. Um, but the one thing is, is that what really drives me and motivates me is that the athletes are so motivated and they, they're hungry to learn. They want to get better. They're phenomenal at following up and following through. I would have to say the majority of the athletes that I've worked with are just like, just dream, dream clients of mine. Um, so wanting to work with somebody, a sports dietitian that truly cares about the athlete and that wants the best for the athlete. And I think one that can really build that relationship, a trusting relationship, a professional relationship too, is, is really important. And a lot of sports dietitians are, because a lot of us are very passionate about what we do. A lot of us were former athletes ourselves. I know I became a sports dietitian because as a young athlete, gosh, when I was in, um, gosh, when, when was that like middle school? Um, you know, I didn't have the best eating habits. And if I only knew now, um, or if I only knew back then what I know now, it would have been such a smoother ride. But if I didn't go, if I didn't go through those challenges, I probably would have never been a sports dietitian. So at, at the end, it, it, it all worked out. Um, so if you want to connect with me, you can um, find me on LinkedIn. I'm also on Instagram and also Facebook. Um, more, I mean, I'm not super active on social media. That's that's one of my goals. But with any questions that you have, you're more than welcome to reach out to me. You can also reach out to me um, by, uh, by email. My email um, is chrissy at nutrition lifestyle education. There's two E's in that too. So chrissy at nutrition lifestyle education.com. And I am happy to answer any of your questions. So the second part of the presentation is going to be about Q and a, when it comes to advocating for your athletes, nutritional requirements. So the first question is how do you get around financial barriers when advocating for your athletes nutritional needs? And so I guess one thing that I would recommend is, gosh, there's, there's many different things that you can do as an athletic trainer to um, help your athletes their, with their nutrition needs from a financial standpoint. Um, I, of course, I would definitely recommend um, looking into that Nancy Clark's guidebook and perhaps um, you know, educating your athletes with the use of that guidebook. Um, it's always good to, to get a dietitian or a sports dietitian involved. So whether that be offering a group presentation where um, say each, um, each team, each member of the, of the team, for example, can you know, contribute to um, the, the, the group setting or the group presentation as opposed to meeting individually with a sports dietitian. 
Um, I know many dietitian or sports dietitians will offer um, complimentary presentations. Um, you can also even reach out to local um, colleges, community colleges, high schools. Maybe there are students that want to get their feet wet a little bit with sports nutrition, and that might be a great way to, um, to help educate your athletes that might have financial barriers. Um, so I would look in, into those different ways for sure to see if any of any of those are helpful in bringing sports nutrition for your athletes. Um, question number two is how can lower income schools eat to perform? Um, well, I, I would kind of piggyback on question number one with those ideas for sure. Um, and then also I mean, recommending to your athletes I and mean, looking at our purchasing um, Nancy Clark's book. I mean, she gives so many great ideas for meals and snacks and performance fuel. So how to fuel before, during, and after training and games. You can incorporate um, what you learn from that, from that guidebook for your athletes that way as well. And really it's about just educating our athletes. I mean, if our athletes can walk away learning one new thing that they can apply to their lifestyle, I think you've already won. So, um, you know, small steps lead to big results. And question number three, what are a few tips pre-game that we can share with coaches for their athlete in relation to nutrition, hydration to help their performance? Um, so definitely education is where it's at. And again, I'm always referring to Nancy Clark's guidebook or books like that because they're, they just have so, many, so much great information that can be easily applied to any athlete. Um, but I think, again, education in terms um, and it depends upon when their games are, but definitely recommending to fuel every day with a balanced breakfast. Um, if their games are later on in the evening, making sure to come prepared. So whether it be having a light dinner before or a snack before, and then bringing some nutrition to have during the games or practices. So water, sports, um, glucose, electrolyte solutions, um, like a Gatorade, a body armor, a power aid, things of that sort. And then also educating not only is performance important, but also very important is recovery nutrition. So when it comes to recovery nutrition, that magic window, I mean, I would say is about one hour post game, post practice, post training, which is where that's the optimal time to refuel. So if you can kind of think of our bodies as being wet sponges after working out or after games, that you don't want that wet sponge to dry out. Um, so post-workout, for example, you want to replete whatever's been lost during that workout. So with good nutrition, so carbohydrates and protein. So just, um, just some simple like tips on like what to pack um, to be prepared to pack for their games, training practices, and also what to pack post-training too, which is really important. Um, question number four. So what are my thoughts on the keto diet for athletes? So the keto diet has ever become the hot topic of today. And you know, if you were to ask me a few years ago, um, about the keto diet, I would have said it's complete bogus, like nobody should eat the keto diet. But what I've learned through my functional nutrition studies is that the keto diet, there are certain populations that can benefit from the keto diet. So basically what the keto diet is, it's primarily fat, I would say, gosh, I can't think of, of the exact numbers right now, but it's, it's high fat, moderate protein, very low carbohydrate. And there are certain populations where the keto diet is helpful. So the keto diet came about because of um, young children that had epilepsy and they found that by eating the keto diet, it helped their epilepsy. Um, now we move to like, you know, 2020, 2021, 
And the keto diet is now helpful for people that have uncontrollable type two diabetes, as well as Alzheimer's patients. So what they're finding out in Alzheimer's patients is that their brains function better off of being in that ketosis state. So where we're, where they're burning fat for energy. Now with athletes, I do not recommend the keto diet. I think it's obviously, of course, always very personalized, individualized. Um, the keto diet, you know, maybe as a jump start, um, but for the long haul, I do not recommend the keto diet. Um, athletes have a lot of muscle mass on them, and whenever you know, with by consuming carbohydrate, the body prefers carbohydrate. The brain functions a, a healthy brain functions off of carbohydrates for energy, and so for athletes, when they eat carbohydrates, they're either going to use that immediately for energy, or it's going to be stored as muscle or glycogen in their muscles as muscle glycogen for energy use later on. And so a lot of athletes have more, have more muscle mass on them so they can eat more carbohydrates. So as far as the keto diet for athletes, I would say no way. So no, you could always like try it. I mean, sometimes I'll have an athlete that they're just so determined to try the keto diet. And I'm like, by all means, if you want to try it, try it, I'll educate you on a keto slash Mediterranean type of diet, but let's see how you feel. And oftentimes they don't feel so great. And so, um, you know, they go back to a more like sports nutrition type of diet for them, which is a good balance of carbs, proteins, and fats. And of course that's individualized for their own energy needs. And um, question number five, so are there specific vitamins and minerals that athletes tend to be deficient in? So, um, you know, it's, it's interesting because I don't think, I mean, one athlete isn't like every other athlete where they're all so different, but I would say among trends that I might see are maybe um, the B vitamins are on the low end. The B vitamins work synergistically together. So if an athlete is deficient in one B vitamin, that's going to affect all the other B vitamins. And because B vitamins are benefit or they're, they're important for energy metabolism. A lot of these athletes have elevated B vitamin needs. And so if they're not getting adequate amounts of B vitamins and their bodies are under stress from, of course, their training practices and games, they tend to be on the lower end of B vitamins. Um, I also see deficiencies in omega threes and the omega three to omega six ratio, I see that elevated. So a lot of people are not consuming adequate amounts of omega threes, especially from, um, like fatty fish, like salmon and tuna and, um, algae or, or seaweed. Um, that's where fish get their omega threes is from the algae. Um, so if you're not a big fish eater, salmon, tuna, um, there's a, there's an acronym called smash. And so it stands for salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, and herring. All of these fish are low mercury, high omega-3. So if your athlete isn't consuming a lot of these, and I would say aiming for at least 12 ounces a week, so three to four fish meals a week, then I would probably take a fish oil supplement about 2000 milligrams a day is what I would say. Um, we can also get the omega threes in plant sources. However, the, the plant form isn't as beneficial as the fish algae form. Um, so the plant forms would be like walnuts, ground flax seeds, chia seeds, um, so I would definitely, if you're not getting adequate amounts of fish in your diet, I would take a, an omega-3 supplement, um, either from algae, if you're vegan or from like salmon or whatever, um, wild, um, fish that they get it from. Um, the other problem is, is that our diets are so high in omega sixes, especially all the processed vegetable oils. And so by consuming too much of the omega sixes, we're throwing that ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 way off. So an optimal ratio of omega-3s to omega-6 should be like a 
three to one to four to one. But in today's day and age, I mean, it's like 16 to 20 omega sixes to omega threes. So it's way off. So we have to eat more fish or I mean, better yet is also cutting back on the processed foods.